Good evening, family. How are you doing? Welcome and thank you so much for joining me tonight. I pray that all is well with you. It's been a while since I have had the opportunity to be live. I, I was not feeling well. I hadn't been feeling well, actually, for the majority of this month. But praise God, I do feel great. And I'm so happy and excited to be here with you tonight. We are discussing dismantling the altar of deception, narcissists, and love bombing. Because don't you know that when you have an, whenever there is a narcissist on the scene, you are you have to understand that there is deception and strong deception that is taking place. We we discuss narcissistic abuse from a biblical and a spiritual focus, so that we are able to not just heal. Um, heal mentally and emotionally, but holistically, right? Body, mind, soul, and spirit. So I want to thank you so much for joining me tonight. I pray that all is well with you and your families. Thank you so much. Um, welcome and thank you for your comment. Looking forward to this conversation. It's great. Welcome and thank you so much for joining. Hello, Kiana. Kian Thomas. I hope I'm saying your name right. Good evening to you and thank you so very much for being here tonight. God bless you all. So before we get started tonight, I just wanted to take a moment to invite you to join me, to connect with me on social media. My my username or my handle on all social media platforms is Pink Girl Teaches, right? So that is for YouTube, TikTok. Well, of course, we're on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, that's an opportunity for us to connect in a more intimate way and to have more conversations conversations. I have had to put a pause on when Queens convene because my schedule has kind of um, shifted somewhat, somewhat. So I'm just trying to figure out when it's going to be the best day for us to jump back into our Bible study. Um, when we do have when Queens convene again, we are going to be discussing Athelia from 2 Kings chapter 11 and also um, 2 Chronicles 22 and 23. So Athelia, for those that don't know, it is Jezebel. She is Jezebel's daughter. When Queens convene as a Bible study, we study a different woman in the Bible every month. So I want to thank you so much for being here. If you have not had the opportunity to hit the like button, please do go ahead and do that as you come in. And if you don't mind helping me out in our live stream, type it in the comments, type it in the chats. This live stream does not have, and this this channel does not have a moderator. The Holy Spirit is our moderator. And we've had a very peaceful experience. You know, the experience on here has been very peaceful without many disturbances because the Holy Spirit is our moderator. But I need your help to put that in the comments so that the people that come in and join the live stream also don't forget to hit that like button. That is the one of the most uh, profound ways that you can support me if you are somebody that really does believe in the work that I do here and what happens on this channel. A, a like, you know, a like goes a very long way. And also come back and make a comment once the live stream is over. That is another way that you can support this video or this channel as well as watching another video. So I want to thank you for being here. Hello, Christine. It's great to see you. God bless you. And thank you for taking your time or taking time to join me tonight. Oh, Kim says, hello. This is my first live with you. God bless you. And thank you so much for being here tonight. I, I pray that, you know, this live stream will be one that is edifying to you, one that will help you. Um, yes. So God bless you. Thank you, Kim. Holy Spirit, please come and guide and protect us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for being here, um, Squirrel Girl. I thank you for your time and for being here. So let us dive into our conversation tonight. We're discussing again, dismantling the altar of deception, narcissists and love bombing. And if you know somebody that needs to hear this word, whether it's now or later, please don't hesitate to go ahead and share this message with them. This is how we spread the gospel. This is how we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, right? Because we do overcome by the blood of our the lamb, but the word of our testimony testimony is what can actually help somebody else. So if you um, if you remember, for those that have been here before, hey, Jane, welcome and thank you for being here. Um, I've had conversations before about altars. We talk about these demonic altars and what is necessary to um, what they are and how we go about destroying these altars. When it comes to altars, they are godly altars, but there are also demonic altars. Hey, fruit inspectors, good to see you. Welcome. And I am feeling so much better. Thank you so much for your prayers and for your kind message. 
Uh, but when it comes to an altar, it is a place where things are legalized in the spirit realm. So if you think about it, that we stand in front of an altar for many things. It can be a baby dedication. It can be baptism. When you see people being elevated into um, into offices within the church, right, within the kingdom, um, you'll find that, you know, ordinations, consecrations, commissionings, all take place at an altar because something is happening, right? Um, you find people stand up to preach and to teach at the altar. You find people stand at an altar to get married. An altar is a place of authorization in the spirit realm, and then it manifests in the natural, right? It comes to pass in the natural after it has been authorized in the spirit. Like we always say here, life is spiritual, right? And whatever, whatever, whatever is legalized and authorized in the spirit is going to manifest in the natural. This works both ways in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, as well as the kingdom of darkness. Altars work in the same, the, you know, the same concept, right? And so we have to understand that the devil didn't come to play nice with you. You know, it's 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 interesting. People will think that, oh, I wish the devil would get his neck off my, you know, his foot off my neck because I, you know, things are hard. And why does he have to play dirty? Why does he have to be like this? The devil. The Bible lets us know that he, he is a liar. He has been a liar to, since the beginning of times. The Bible also refers to him as the father of all lies. So why, why would we think that, you know, if the Bible has described him like that, why would he suddenly change his MO and become a different person when he does the work of decept of deceiving, when he comes to do what he what he really does, steal, kill, and destroy? He is going to be faithful to, to his MO, right? So the devil will never at one point play fair. And this is why we have to understand that when we when we consider things that well, when we consider that life is spiritual, right? And we have the presence of altars in our life, whether you know it or you don't. This is why it's so important that we erect godly altars, right? It is so important that we examine our lives, our spiritual lives, because really our natural lives be, will mirror what is happening in the spirit. So when we begin to talk about narcissists and love bombing, you got to understand that there is something that has been authorized. There is something that was authorized in the spirit. But the thing about it is, hey, Sharon, hello, Nandy. Thank you so much for joining. As you come in, please ladies and gentlemen hit that like button thank you so much what you have to what you have to know whether it's knowingly or unknowingly remember when we talk about sins there is there is the sin of omission and the sin of commission the known and the unknown right and so this why I would, that's why I was mentioning the enemy never came to play fair with you the enemy never came to play nice with you his desire is always going to bring disaster it's always going to bring turmoil the enemy is not going to be satisfied unless he is unless he's really having his way unless he is doing what he came to do. So I, I, I need you to understand that, right? And I need you to not to not take it personal because it's really not personal. The enemy hates everybody. The enemy does not want a single person to thrive or to prosper. If the enemy could have it his way, we would all be headed to hell with him. We would all experience the same spiritual destiny as he did or that, or that he has waiting for him because that is his desire. You got to understand and the enemy does not like not a single one of us. And that's okay. We didn't come here to be liked by the enemy. That's not our goal and our desire. And it's also not to be the place or, or the thing that we focus on, right? So when we begin to be, when we begin to think about about narcissists, right? And how they come into our lives and they come along with this spirit of deception, right? Everything that the narcissist does from get go is deception. So this is why we have things that are authorized in the spirit because we don't even know that we are walking into spiritual warfare. We don't even know that some of our agreements, right? Because you got to understand your agreement is so crucial. Your agreement is important, right? There is power in agreement and the enemy comes for your agreement. But the thing about it is you don't have the full facts. You don't have the whole story because the narcissist, as we know, is lying. The narcissist narcissist is scheming. The narcissist comes in love bombing you. And let me say this, love bombing is not a flex. I remember a few weeks ago, somebody left a comment 
saying that, oh, well, I love bomb my, 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 my partner or whatever she said, and there's nothing wrong with it. Love bombing is always going to be toxic because it's a form of emotional abuse and it is manipulation. You know, there's such a thing as doing things for each other and being reciprocal in a relationship. There is a way that we can demonstrate, you know, our interest as well as our intentions in a relationship that does not mean that we manipulate people. It does not mean that we exploit their emotions. It doesn't mean that we engage in witchcraft because essentially that's what it is. But where there is love bombing, you got to understand that it is a strong spirit. Number one, it's a spirit of delusion because the enemy wants you delulu. The enemy does not want you to have a straight thought. The enemy does not want you to have a sound mind. And that's what the Bible tells us to be sober. The enemy, the, the Bible tells us that we must have a sound mind, right? But how do you have a sound mind when you're, when you, when you have this spirit of deception and there is a covenant with the spirit of deception. So now this is we this is where we see that this demonic altar is being empowered because the narcissist will continue to do the work to feed that altar. The narcissist will continue to do all things to keep you constrained, to keep you bound and tied and chained down to this altar, right? So this spirit of deception, we know that it comes from the devil. Um when we are talking about love bombing and what happens is the narcissist comes to play on your mind, right? And so even though I'm saying narcissist, please understand that it's very interchangeable. When we're calling the narcissist or we're, when I'm beginning to use the, the word devil, you got to understand that I'm now referring into the, I'm talking about what is happening in the spirit realm. I'm talking about the one that is actually commissioned the narcissist to do that work, right? So and we know, we understand that they are agents, they are agents of wickedness. They are, these are the devil's foot soldiers, the devil's missionaries, right? Because listen, for, for things to begin to manifest or to happen, when it comes to the, you know, um, spiritual warfare and for them to begin to manifest what has to happen, the enemy needs a body. The narcissist provides that body, you know, that person provides the body so that the demonic forces can have an outlet or a way to operate, to strike and to attack in a physical sense. So when we begin to see how love bombing plays or takes, takes effect is it starts with your mind. Yes, it's going to trickle down into your emotions because you end up getting those, those, you know, those, those hot feelings. You begin to feel, oh, I got a crush on them. I like them. You know, your emotions will play a part, but the, the assault starts in your mind. This is why when I talk to you about healing from narcissistic abuse, it has to start in your mind. And part of it starting in your mind means that you have to grasp the truth that everything that you experienced was a lie. There was no truth in anything the narcissist said. The only truth that a narcissist that comes out of a narcissist's mouth is typically at the end of the relationship when they are devaluing you, when they are when they believe they are discarding you, when they think that they can get nothing more out of you and that things are over. But we understand that with these people, these people they are always over calculating, always overestimating themselves and their reach and their power. So they also underestimate you, your ability to get back up, your ability to put yourself together and continue to heal and to move forward. So when we look at this spirit of deception, right, it comes in plays, it plays in on your mind heavy and it affects you in the area of, you know, of, of being able to move forward after this whole thing is over because from the very get-go the narcissist knows that this relationship this situation whether it is a friendship even if they are raising you as a child whatever the situation is the enemy knows full well that there is an expiration date on it because there are these these patterns and cycles are repetitive. So even as we begin to talk about patterns and cycles, there are certain patterns and cycles that continue to re replay in these relationships and even in your life afterwards because they are powered by these demonic altars. And so it's going to take you to consciously step um, step aside, renounce the, the covenant, right? Renounce those agreements, repent for the sin and, and begin the process of healing emotionally and spiritually, right? And many, and many times there's also recovering physically as well as financially. So there's so many ways that this abuse affects us. But what happens is this spirit um, wages war 
this spirit of deception. It wages war in your mind. And this is where that cognitive dissonance steps in. You see things one way and you'll be like, I know that, you know, this isn't good for me, but... And then there's that battle that that lingers on afterwards. So even when you are, when you catch yourself ruminating, you got to understand that that's the manifestation of the spirit of deception. Because the narcissist, a lot of times people will ruminate while they're still in the relationship, but also after the relationship. And the focus is heavy on, oh, the love bombing stage when everything felt when everything felt like you were floating on cloud nine when things felt like this is this is better than sliced bread this is the next best thing since sliced bread when everything felt so good and so right but this is in the middle of the this is at the very beginning of the of the relationship where there's nothing but deception and when we really grasp with our minds and we really accept that listen nothing was real it really does it really does cause there to be a disruption in this system in this um in this altar right it causes a shaking in that foundation and the thing about it is we want to get to the root and if we're going to get to the root of a thing we can't start with the fruit we got to start digging down because listen if we can uproot something right we understand that the fruit the leaves the the you know um the the signs of of life to that tree that the signs of life they will wither as the roots die. So just because it looks like, you know, things are not flourishing in your life, but if you have done the work to do that root work and get to the core of what is going on, don't worry because you know that it's going to catch up. The very things that you've been fighting to kill and to destroy in the spirit realm, right? The evil things, that is, they're all going to end time. They are going to die and you'll begin to see the manifestations of what you have planted, of what you have been watering, of what you have been feeding. And you'll begin to see those roots, those roots begin to, um, on, on the outside, they will begin to show you the, the, the manifestation of the work that you have done on that, on, on, on that level. Hello, Wise Counseling Coaching. It's great to see you. I pray that all is well with you. God bless you and thanks for being here. So when we what what, what you got to understand about the spirit of deception, right? This spirit really comes to consume the lives of the uh, you know it comes to consume your life and eradicate the peace of God. Because listen, the, what happens with these relationships? There's so much back and forth and that inner turmoil that the narcissist brings. How does the narcissist bring the inner turmoil throughout all the devaluation, throughout all the crazy making, throughout all the sleepless nights, throughout all the lies, and they your mind goes back to, but you know, what happened to this person? He was such a great man. What happened to this woman? No, that was just a great show. That's all it was. They sowed a seed in your mind and now the real McCoy is showing up, right? So it causes, you know, it causes, it causes there to be, um, just some type of confusion in your mind because of what is happening. But this this spirit, like I say, the spirit of deception, um, let, let's talk about some signs of the spirit of deception, right? Being stuck in the same spot and you tend to experience a lack of progression, right? And this is also consumed and powered by that demonic altar, but also the lies that the enemy tells you. This is why it's very important that during your season of healing, right? During your season of growth, because this is what it is. Your healing should lead to a place of growth, personal growth and development, as well as spiritual growth and development. What the enemy doesn't want you to do is to grow. The enemy wants to actually cap your growth. The enemy comes to stunt your growth. And he does this by the lies that he tells. And this is one of the things narcissists do so skillfully is that they speak speak lies into your subconscious mind all day, all night. They constantly feed you with lies about who you are, lies about your destiny, and, and also just their behavior. It's so contradictory. A lot of times they have multiple lives, right? Multiple lives. And sometimes people think, how is it possible for somebody to have, to have three and four lifestyles, right? Three and four families for some people. But this is, you got to understand that they're getting supernatural strength from the kingdom of darkness. And the enemy is always going to empower, right? Think about that demonic altar. And let me say this, one of the reasons why the enemy will continue to, to strike you with abuse or, or, you know, 
with different um, attacks from the narcissist. And when I say different attacks, you know, you can go through a season where they're gaslighting you. Then here comes the devaluation and the projection. When the narcissist, the narcissist continues to dig into their demonic toolbox so that they can, they can inflict more pain in your life. This makes the devil very happy because number one, the devil feeds off pain. The devil feeds off the emotions that are that, that you are releasing when you experience one of these disappointments, when you have a reaction to the abuse that you're experiencing. The enemy feeds off of that, but not only that, his minions feed off of it too. And then they and as they eat, what they do is they empower the narcissist to do bigger and better things. And when I say bigger, I don't mean big in a good way. But to to really tear you apart, this is why you think like sometimes you think, oh, my goodness, I can't believe that they would do this to me. I've really hit a new low. And then here comes something else that that they throw at you. Right. And then you're like, oh, my goodness, I thought that what they did last time was bad, but it's only been two weeks. Sometimes it's been two days, two hours, and they hit a new low because there is there is a need. They have to deliver. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. So let's just think about steal, right? Let's just think about the word steal. He's come to take something from you. He's come to 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 cause a, a robbery. He's come to to pull away from you. Sometimes it's your virtue, right? Sometimes it's your mental faculties, your ability to think straight. They come to a, exactly come back seven times worse. That's right, Nandy. They come to really arrest you in the spirit realm because when you when when uh, when when there's the steal, kill, and destroy, a lot of times it just depletes you. It causes you to be to be stuck. And then this is where we see the spirit of stagnation begin to play into this relationship because this, and this is all powered by that altar that was established with love bombing. So when we're looking at this altar of love bombing, number one, deception. Then the next thing that we have is the spirit of backwardness, stagnation, and delay. These basically operate in the same manner and, you know, um, and it will cause you to go in circles for years and years and years. But if you are going in circles for years and years and years, guess what's not happening in your life? You're not making any progress. So we see that there's a lack of advancement. There is a lack of development. There are repetitive cycles. And these are cycles that for some people, you don't even realize that you're in this cycle because you are in survival mode. And when you're in survival mode, you're not able to be be fully connected to your emotions. And if you're not fully connected to your emotions, that means there's a lack of self-awareness. That means that, you know, there is no, or they, there is no, or potentially a lot of limited self-concept, right? And so you continue to just repeat the same thing. And also there comes, there comes burnout, which is what our last workshop was on, right? There goes that burnout where now you feel like I'm just so tired. I, I What's the point? Why even try? I'm exhausted. And then what happens is the enemy tells you it's not that you're exhausted, but you're lazy. But the truth of the matter is not a single person was created to, to live a prolonged lifetime or a prolonged time, should I say, a prolonged time in survival mode. Survival mode is to get us from point A to point B and we have time to heal and, and you know, recover, recoup so that we can move forward. But when you have stayed stuck in survival mode on autopilot, doing the bare minimum to get through, doing what you need to soothe your emotions. And here's another way this spirit of deception begins to actually play in your lives, right? The enemy will whisper in your ear that, oh, you know what? Listen to what, listen to what culture is telling you. It's okay for you to spend up all your money going on a shopping spree because it's retail therapy. Those are lies. Those are lies. And a lot of those things, retail therapy, some people uh, become workaholics. Some people turn to alcohol. Some people become promiscuous because they need the intimacy and there's a lack of intimacy, but they fail to realize that intimacy starts way before you ever get into a bedroom. And all that you're going to experience um, in the bedroom is a manifestation of the work that you do 
it out. But because you think and you've been deceived to believe that a warm body next to you is the epitome of intimacy, the spirit, that altar continues to be powered. And so you see people that just have a loop of relationships. They have, they overlap relationships, never allowing themselves the time to breathe, never allowing themselves the time to regroup and recover. And this is where you also see for some people, it's narcissist after narcissist. Here come a psychopath. Here come a sociopath. There go the more narcissists. And it's all of, all of what this does is it wears you out. And when you really think about being in survival mode, think about being chained down to one of these demonic altars. Think about being chained down to the altar of deception. That tells you that you don't have any strength in you to come out. You, you don't have anything. But the word of God tells us in the same scripture, John 10 and 10, he says, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. But the spirit of deception comes to fight the word of God in your life. The spirit of deception comes to tell you that, you know what, God, God can do it for everybody, but you are too dirty to be to be clean. And then there becomes this fight for your faith. And then remember, like in, in many stories in the Bible, like even if we go to the woman with the issue, she was told your faith has made you whole. But how do I have faith now when I've been in this survival mode and I've just been doing the bare minimum that I can to get by? And, I, and now you're telling me I've got to believe and have faith? How? I don't even have faith in, in, you know, in my ability to do anything. And that's where the enemy deceives you because you think that it's your ability to do something that is going to give you faith when to have faith, you must believe. And this is what a lot of people also that are deceived by these religious narcissists begin to believe. You see what happens with the religious narcissists, right? They come and they love bomb you with scripture. They come and they love bomb you with the gospel. <laughs> I, you know, this one guy, I remember a couple of years ago when I thought, you know what, sis, go out and start getting to meet people, whatever, whatever. I met this one pastor this this preacher guy and for what it's worth in you know in that stage in that getting to know each other in that talking stage he presented the gospel he shared the gospel a lot um there was always the, it, it, the love bombing was there right when i look in retrospect the love bombing was there but you know when things just didn't add up i was like dude bye you're not going to waste my time. So we didn't talk for too long, but the way he came with the gospel, right? And thankfully I was able to discern him for what he was. But what I want to say and why I mentioned that is that a lot of people will fall for, for the religious narcissist, right? Because we, we want a man of God, right? And we want this, or we want a woman of God. You want a woman of God. You want somebody that you can share your faith with. But the, the enemy knows exactly, he knows your desires. And he sends you that bozo before the Boaz. He sends you, he sends you that curse when you should be receiving a blessing. All of these things to tie you down and to chain you. And what you got to understand is a narcissist can tell you, I don't care who they are, a narcissist, psychopath, sociopath, any one of them can come and tell you that I am a believer in Christ. And they may believe in Christ. That doesn't mean anything. They, I believe that the sky is blue. So they can also say that, yeah, I'm a believer in Christ, but what does it mean? Where is the fruit of that? Where is the evidence? And this is why we can, you, you can't allow yourself to be sucked in by what they present. You know, um, you got to be very careful because, you know, what, what they're coming after is their lustful desires, right? They have a desire to feast off you spiritually, right? They have a desire to feast off you physically, financially, emotionally, psychologically. They've come to siphon. They've come to suck. Y'all, you know, they talk about narcissists being energy vampires, right? I've done several visit videos about narcissists being soul hunters. They literally come to siphon your virtues. And why does this happen? Because the enemy, once those virtues are siphoned, number one, you become stuck. You go back into that survival mode because something has been stolen from from you and a lot of times you're unaware and you begin to go around in these circles right in these circles searching for what is lost but sometimes we don't even know what has been stolen we don't even know some of the things and what another thing about listen love bombing is so incredibly demonic and toxic because as much as that altar is working that love bombing is also spell casting and i talk a lot i talk about it being like drinking the devil's cocaine because you take a sip of that right and i got my oh, i got my tea here you take a sip right and then what's going to happen is you're going to get that high 
And that's what the enemy wants. You get that high of that of that the devil's Kool-Aid, the devil's cocaine. You, you take that first hit. And because that high does whatever it does and it feels good. And this is why it's so important for us to heal, family. It's so important for us to heal because you got to recognize that narcissists never appeal to the adult you. They always appeal to that wounded inner child. They will appear to your to your soul wounds, right? To the core hurts. And that's why it feels like we make such a strong connection because they are actually hitting on your pain points. And how do they do this? The work of familiar spirits. This is why we talk about this is spiritual warfare. You know, when you're born, right, an angel is assigned to you. But also the enemy will assign his demonic angel, his his angel of darkness. And so you've got to be very aware of it. Hey, Shannon, it's great to see you. Yes, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to be going live um, because my schedule has changed now. So I'm just, you know, trying to figure out how this is going to go down. But thank you so much for joining. Hello, Beauty B. Thank you for being here. So what happens is... Um, I'm not I'm trying to, where was I? <laughs> so what happens is we're talking about, we're talking about that love bombing, that devil's cocaine, that's right. So what happens is the narcissist or that, that, that first hit, the elusive first hit, if you talk to a junkie, they're going to tell you that the first hit is always the best and they stay chasing that first high. But that first high is never, or the next high, that right? Every subsequent high after that is not going to be as potent as the first one. And so that's, that's but they continue to chase it. So what the enemy wants you essentially to do is turn into a spiritual junkie, into a love junkie, always seeking that next hit from the narcissist. That's why a lot of times when they devalue, right? And then suddenly they become nice. It feels good because you're getting another hit of that devil's cocaine and it feels good. And it's like, oh, okay. So he still loves me and I still have a relationship and everything is still good. And so we continue to go forward until we're desperate for the next hit. And this is that cycle. The, the, and this is where those those soul ties are reinforced that trauma bond that back and forth with the, the the love bombing and the devaluing and it all makes you crazy like it drives you crazy it is it is insane how it makes you feel and i'm testifying to that it is insane but you have got to be you've got to be mindful when when i said to you that a narcissist a psychopath and a sociopath will tell you that i am a believer ask them what does it mean to be a believer and these religious narcissists are going to hit you with lies straight from the pits of hell. They are going to tell you, I am a good person. We know that it's not good. They say, I give to charities. And for some of them, yes, they do. The only reason they give to charities is because it's a tax write-off for them. So they're getting everything back. So the reason they give may not be why you may give. You may give because you want to help somebody. So it doesn't have to be something that they that you can write off, right? Because you, not everybody is able to or in a position to, that, that receives donations is in a position to give you that tax write-off break, right? Because of the way it's structured. But they will give where they know that they can get that money back. They will tell you, I've been baptized. That's not a lie. But for them, there is no emotion attached to it. There is no commitment. It's just going along with the facade. They're creating this illusion so that they can have a springboard to stand before you and tell you, but I did all these things. I got the paperwork to back it up, boo. They can tell you like, listen, I got a commission. I am now the apostle and I am the chief apostle. Yeah, but it don't mean nothing if they are not a disciple. So you gotta be mindful of what the difference is. And you gotta also allow yourself time to cool off before you, before you actually are taking the next step into these commitments. Narcissists will hold up the facade for as long as they want to, right? And 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 for some people, you know, it's very quick. The minute they get your your um your 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 verbal agreement, right? As long as that until that contract is solidified. That's why some of you got a pause on on having intimacy, on having sex with people, because that in itself is a contract. So people will say, oh, well, you know, yeah, we're just getting to know each other, but we're doing these things. But like, that's backwards. 
Because if you understand the spiritual implications that come from just sex by itself, oh, okay, let's, okay, maybe you're not doing all that, but oh, you're kissing still. Now you're exchanging still bodily fluids, right? And there is an agreement that is still formed. It may not be the same as sex, but there is that, that there is a, an agreement when you come together like that and you are still, ex there is still, a, they still have a way to siphon from you. They still pull your virtues, right? And this is where you'll find out that some of them will become the number one, the best, that, the best at just kissing so that they can entice you like that. So you got to be very mindful and allow yourself the time to cool down, allow yourself the time to just, you know, um, begin to qualify them, right? Because you got to understand that for them, it's it's, imp it's powered by nothing but lust. But you got to remember that when lust expires, they check out. When lust expires, it's time for the real abuse to take place. But by that point, you're drunk on this cocaine. You're drunk on this Kool-Aid and now getting out and getting to your right mind. That's why the Bible tells us be sober. So we can't be sipping on this. We can't be taking hits of that. And so when you now say that the narcissist will tell you I'm a believer, but now you got to tell them and you got to know that you know that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But to be a follower of Jesus means that you are first and foremost a disciple of Jesus. And so that means that you are a wholehearted supporter of Jesus, right? You're a pupil. You're a student of the word of of God, you're a learner that holds fast to the teachings of Christ, to the teachings of the Bible, and you are actually going through with a heart change and a heart posture that is towards him. It's no longer to the flesh. It's no longer to your carnal desires. You're willing to crucify your flesh. You're willing to present your body as a living sacrifice, right? So you got to, when people tell you that they are a believer, just examine the fruit. Just examine the fruit. And these are things where we can also take another step further and really be prayerful about these things, right? There's nothing wrong with pausing and taking time to pray before moving forward in a situation, praying and actually waiting on God for the answer, even before a date, even before whatever. Pray even fast, right? Because we want results. We want answers. So you have got to be sure that you are creating an environment for yourself and for yourself to actually prosper in life because when we jump into when we jump into these things you know head first or in fact not even head first but we just falling into people talk about I fall into love or I fell uh you know I, I can't I fall in love quickly people talk about falling in love but there's a danger about that because a lot of times if you are to fall you won't get hurt. When an old person falls, right, they tend to break bones. So a fall, even, even with babies, right, they, they fall, but they're all in the process of learning. But like at some point we grow up and we got to realize that falling in love is not cute. Falling in love does not align with the word of God, but we can grow in love. I can grow to love you and I get to grow to love you because I've had time to examine your fruit. I've had time to stay in the word. I've had time to pray fast and seek God about this. And I have the release to go forth and love you. And so now I'm not going to be pouring out my oil on somebody that doesn't deserve it. And I'm also going to be protecting and preserving myself. So now here come personal accountability as well as boundaries, because you got to remember that your boundaries are not there for anybody else to respect and honor. They are for you. you the, onus to on, on, the onus to respect boundaries is always going to fall on you. You can tell me your boundaries, but if it means nothing to me and I have a different type of agenda, I'm coming through to walk all over your boundaries. That's what the narcissist is going to do. So you got to be 10 toes down on yourself and say, listen, I'm, 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 I'm going to protect and preserve who I currently am as well as who I am becoming. So when you look at your boundaries, don't do that. Don't, don't create boundaries that establish a wall that keep, or that prevent people from being able to come into your life, because that's where we're still in survival mode. That's where we are still guarded. We're hyper vigilant. We're walking on eggshells, but you got to look at your boundary as a bridge that extends to relationships that are going to be wholesome, that are going to be healthy. And there are some people that the troll, they, they, they cannot cross that bridge. They get denied access from the other side because we are now beginning to discern them, right? It was, I remember when I first, you know, was learning about narcissists and I would see comments, right? And people were like, I can see a narcissist from a mile away. I can smell them coming. But 
I don't I don't always believe in that because narcissists they sh they shape shift. You're going to get a different version. The enemy is always the Bible says for the the enemy is like an angel of light. He is going to transform, he is going to change. Good evening Daryl, thank you so much for being here. He is going to change and he is going to be something different. He's going to present. If you used to a malignant narcissist, here come a covert. And that covert can be more harmful than a malignant. I know they are all evil, but when when you realize the deception of that covert and the covert is going to come to you like, I'm a good woman. I'm a godly woman. I'm upright, sir. You don't have to worry about me. Those are, That's the card she's going to play. And she's going to play it for a long time because this is, you know, this is how the enemy wants to draw you in. So when you get, and I'm, you know, that, that covert is going to love bomb you differently. And a lot of times, you know, uh, it, 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 it can even tie you down even more to that demonic altar. Right. So what happens for some people, right? That, that, that next one, if you don't, if you are not, you know, discerning and if you are not growing and if you are allowing yourself to be deceived by the enemy, right? By telling yourself that it couldn't be me. It couldn't be me. I, I would know, I would know these things. I've watched all the videos. I've watched all the videos. I've read all the blogs. I've read all the books. I'm a narc buster. I'm a narc detector. No, we're to be disciples, right? Because that's how you're going to begin to discern that spirit that's coming your way. There's something in your spirit that is going to go off, that is going to alert you, that is going to that is going to cause you to, to see things differently. There's something that even months before it happens, your dream life can be changed. And I remember, th I remember when that happened to me, like I first of all had this dream and I was like, oh, look like it's time for things to go down for me until I began to take time to really pray about that dream when it was a warning. So let me tell you about this real quick. It happened several years ago, right? And I had this dream that I was like in this open area. And it kind of, to me in that dream felt like a Walmart parking lot. And I was putting some bags in the trunk of my car and I had a gray car, but at the time I had a blue car. So I was like, okay, whatever. And so, um, you know, I wasn't, I was like, okay, but that's, so I was saying, oh, yippee, new car type thing. So I was getting excited. Like it's, it's about to be popping and I'm putting these things and this man approaches me, right. And he approaches me. And what was crazy is that we were wearing certain clothes. Like I had on a denim shirt and some white jeans and he had on some white shorts and a, and a, and a blue shirt or a denim shirt, whatever it was. And he came from a gray car and I was like, oh, okay. And you know, he was, in his presentation in the dream it was it was just everything was gucci everything was good and so i was like okay so in my carnal mind i'm thinking yeah okay it's about to be um i'm, I'm gonna be in walmart let me go to walmart let me let me let me try to push this thing forward but let me tell you when i began to pray i knew no this is not the way to go and i was like well why did it seem so good deception so several months later here i am at actually a gas station, open space. And this man, and, and what's crazy is I was on my way to a solo date, right? And so everything that I said I was wearing, I was wearing, I had on that denim shirt, I had on these white jeans and I had a new car at this time. I had a gray car now. And so I was like, hmm, this man approaches and I'm looking at his car and it was smack, it was smack on, gray, and I'm like, okay. And we were, he was wearing the denim shirt, white shorts. And so here's that dream coming. Praise God that there's an, uh, you know, there's that, uh, that awakening in my spirit that says, sis, watch out. This is what we were, this is what I'm talking to you about. Don't do this. And I had no real desire to talk to him or anything, but down the road, the way things work, I was able to find out who he was and all of these things without even going to look for it. And child, if Dodge the Bullet was a person, it was me in that moment because a whole sociopath, whole sociopath. But I, I was able and I was fortunate and I'm thankful that I was able to see that experience without experiencing that experience. So what I'm trying to say to you is that there are ways that when we are actually walking in alignment, that the spirit of God is going to alert us that we don't have to fall down and in, in these pits. You know, we have these prayer points sometimes where we can say like, you know, if it's time for me to be aggressive or whatever, right, I'm going to command the strong man to come forth, fall down and die. 
right, in the name of Jesus. But what that strong man wants you to do is come forth as in that situation I just described, fall down, fall down in love and die, right? Die of disappointment, die of depression, die in stagnation, die unfulfilled, die without ever experiencing the abundant life that God has for you because of this love bombing, right? So you got to be very mindful that you have to afford yourself the opportunity to actually pray. We shouldn't be making decisions about partnerships and about getting involved with people before we actually present these things to our father, before we actually allow ourselves the time to pray. And the thing about it is if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready, right? So you may not have seen it coming. You may not have dreamt like I did, but there is some way that the spirit of the living God is going to tell you because guess what? He protects you. He loves you. The Bible tells us that the Lord is my shepherd. So you examine the role of a shepherd. Number one is to protect. So much so that he leaves the 99 to go after the one. So think about that level of protection that he has for you, that he desires for you. And so we begin to shift our mindsets, right? And not just our mindset, but our heart posture. We got to be true to this, right? Because we understand that life is spiritual, right? So don't believe them just because they tell you that they are a believer. You got to examine the fruits. Don't get in the habit of asking questions. What the enemy never wants you to do is ask questions, ask questions. And sometimes even when you are talking to God and you are asking him questions, why me, why me, why me? Rephrase your, and if you are not getting answers, should I say, let me say that first. You're asking the same question, but you're not getting an answer. Like he is quiet. Rephrase your question. God, now that this has happened several times, what are you teaching me? What am I missing? What is the lesson? Rephrase that question. And a lot of times or oftentimes, if not always, you are going to see that you get your answer because now you start asking the right question, right? So why me may not be the right question because why not you? If his own son, his only begotten son was, was crucified, why not you to experience some things? So it's, it's important to rephrase that question sometimes, right? So let's continue to go on about this um, dismantling this altar of, of, love bombing, right? So another thing we talked about how it brings forth, how it brings forth or how it empowers the spirit of deception in your life. And that this where this where let me let me say this about the spirit of deception before I move on. One thing about the or some things about the spirit of deception is it comes to make you have trust issues. It comes to make you suspicious that you doubt everybody around you and we see this where people will always believe that the world has more narcissists than good people. People will say oh there is more, you know, there's narcissists everywhere. When sometimes it's really not narcissists everywhere but the enemy and the deception think about that demonic altar that what was legalized at that altar is being empowered and we're seeing the manifestation in your life when you believe that you can't trust anybody. But if you can't trust anybody, how do you trust your brother and sister in the Lord? When Christ is about community, when we are able to see throughout scripture, the importance of community, the importance of family, right? So how would you, how then you say, I can't, I can't go to the church because the church is all deceptive. No, there are some churches that are full of believers and no disciples, but we, once we discern that we got to be willing to separate ourselves from those and go where they are actual disciples so that we can grow, right? And we grow in community. And one of the things you got to understand about a, a community of faith is they enrich your life. They edify your life. It is, it is lonely to go through life without believers, without people that you can gather with, without people you, can, you can't break bread with. Think about it. When you are having life's moments, who do you go to? Who, you, who do you go to? It's all good to say, you know what? I'm going to watch some of her videos. I'm going to go on Joy's website. I'm going to read one of the blogs. I'm going to be encouraged that way. But it's not enough. Sometimes you need somebody to physically be there. I can't be there. I'm on the internet. I can't be there. So There's a lot of constraints, right? There's distance. There's geographical restraints. Uh, that alone. Who is there in your physical life? Who whose shoulder are you gonna lean on? Who are you gonna talk to? Where when when listen, life happens while we live. There are going to be moments, and we, you know, I'm not speaking this over our lives, but we have to be very realistic that we will face sickness, 
whether it's you or a family member, there is, there is even moments where people will have, we will experience death in our lives, not necessarily ours, but people that we love with who going to cry with you. Who's going to mourn with you? Who's going to go through this with you? And when, and if you are going through it alone, right. And if you are, and if you know that, that, that the belief is that there's nobody out there for me, that's where we see that the deception is working. Maybe that group of people, those group of people were not right for you, but there is the world. How many are we like 8 billion people now, eight plus billion people. And there is not one person that can really have your back. The devil is a whole liar. Do you know what 8 billion people is? It is a massive number, but the enemy wants you to believe. Don't trust none of them because of two and three people, four, five, six people. Okay, maybe a hundred people. Don't trust eight billion people because of these 100. Come on now. But that's what the enemy wants you to believe. The enemy wants you to believe that you are living on an island and that you will thrive and survive on this island. But it takes community. Absolutely. Community is different. It is different. And you, it, it's, it's, an, it's a beautiful beautiful thing. And it's, it's a blessing. The Bible says, how can two walk together and accept they be agreed, right? The importance of two, the number two in itself represents unity. The Bible even talks about that is, you know, two are better than one because if one is cold, the other one can warm them up. Like, come on. It is so important. So you have to have to be mindful about building a community. You have every right to, to, to fully qualify that community, run them through the process of, of, you know, however your process works. It must include prayer and fasting, right? And being focused on the word of God to be, make sure that you're really examining the fruit so that you also can begin to thrive. You can also thrive in community. And here's the thing. A lot of times we think about, oh, you know, we, we scared about what can be stolen from us because narcissists steal, kill, destroy. Oh, and, you know, that if it's a pattern and a cycle in your life, right, it, you can feel like it's going to happen to me again. But that's what that spirit of deception does. But what about what you're going to pour into somebody's life? What about the gifts that are in you? They're not just for you. And I'm not even talking about these these, these spiritual gifts. But for some of you, gift of hospitality, some of you, your smile is so incredible that it lights a room and it brings joy to somebody. It brings healing to somebody. Some, it's your very presence because the light in you shines so bright that others feel the warmth that comes from that light. So there are things that you have that you need to give. Listen, remember the parable of the, of the, of the talents, don't, don't, don't be caught on judgment day being asked, like, what did you do with what I gave you? And you're like, well, I kept it because I don't want them to steal from a 100 versus 8 billion. Like let the math math, but this, what the enemy wants you to do is to not trust so that you can turn out to be a loner. But let me tell you, if we're in a desert and there is one person there, you are an easy target for the enemy. He will strike and hit every time versus if you are in community, how is he going to, when we all lift up the shield of faith at the same time, those fiery darts must return back to where they came from in Jesus name. So how are they going to get you? Because you have the, you have strength, you have, you have, um, power in community. Hey, Stephanie, welcome. And thanks so much for joining. So, so this is, this is the things that, you know, that spirit of deception comes along to do. But then let's talk about the spirit of backwardness, stagnation, and delay, right? We talked about the lack of development, the lack of advancement, repetitive cycles. And for some people, it's that spirit of almost. <laughs> I almost made it. I, I did everything I was supposed to do. I, I went for 10 interviews. And when it was time for them, they told me they were going to call me back with the offer. And, you know, I'm just waiting on that. And then you almost had that job that would change the trajectory trajectory of your life. But um, at last minute, they decide to go for somebody else. Oh, I, I almost, I almost, I almost started my business. I set everything up and I did all the things and I, I registered and I did everything, but um, it just didn't work out. So now we're losing investment right? But this is what it all comes to do. And all of it comes to make you feel even more depressed, even more defeated, even more downcast, right? And so 
this is where, you know, even for people, right? I mean, and when you think about, let me just say this, when you're thinking about like that spirit of stagnation, backwardness and delay, it affects you financially. It can affect your career. It can affect you health wise. It can affect your family. So generationally, we know the enemy comes for the entire bloodline, but it can also affect you spiritually, right? So these are all the things that the, this thing powers down or powers or comes to destroy in your life. And so you see that the, the deception that comes through with the love bombing is literally to tie you down. When you really think about that altar, I, I just think about the altar. I'm gonna give you my phone as an example. But now, oh, here's my charger, right? So now we're gonna show, I'm gonna show you, these are all chains, right? Imagine this is a chain and this is how that spirit, we gonna make it even better. Here's you, here's the altar, here's you. Enemy got you on that altar. Love bombing has you down, and here come the chains. Tied down, chains to this demonic altar. And then at the end of it, the enemy is going to put his demonic padlock and keep you there, that there is no way that you can get out. But this is how these demonic altars work. So when you are tied down like that, that's why when you see, when, you, when you're experiencing that, that um, survival mode, when you are stuck on autopilot, it is purely empowered by a demonic altar because you are literally chained down. This is what that spirit of trauma does. Comes in early as it can to chain you down, to chain you down mentally, emotionally, physically, psychologically, you don't mature beyond the age of when that trauma took place. That's why we talk about like child trauma affects millions of lives. It affects millions of lives. Right now we have, we have, um, we have that war going on, right? And we are seeing how they are targeting children, targeting children, right? And children are being targeted. Number one, they are blood sacrifice, blood sacrifice, blood sacrifice. Number two, because why would you, why would you be kids heads like come on why would you be just why 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 blood sacrifice number two the children that are going to survive this even those in in the in ukraine in every war tone every war torn country they're going to ask the same questions because a lot of times they're not going to be resources it's not everybody that is fortunate enough to be able to go to therapy right? It's not everybody that is going to have the resources for that, for that intervention that is needed psychologically, emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually, and that spiritually is the most. In fact, if, if we can be honest, a lot of times the spiritual is going to be ignored. That's why, brothers and sisters, I pray that you are praying. I pray that you are praying for them, that that they that the chains that are being tied, that are tying them down now are breaking, that the padlocks are breaking, that these children will be set free in the name of Jesus. Because when that trauma hits them, for some of them, they are three, four, five, six right? All under 10, those, just think of those ages. They are going to get stuck in that age group. Yeah, they're going to grow. They're going to mature. We can look at it for some of us from our own perspective of where pain met us, right? And so people get stuck in those places, but to be a grown up and, and that inner child be so unhealed and has so much, un, so much trauma on the inside is going to cause problems later in life. But this is where, and, and a lot of these problems and a lot of the things that are that are being powered and released right now is even going to keep people from accepting that Jesus really is Lord, that he is really their healer and redeemer, that he is their deliverer, even at, la at a later age, because the, they will like to say, where was God? Couldn't he see? Didn't he know? But like, when, <laughs> let me say this, some of us, right? Let's just be honest. People be out here. And I'm not talking about the narcissist. I'm talking about us in the healing community. We be lying, stealing, cheating, backbiting, gossiping. You, you may be healed or you may be delivered from those, but we did it at one point. Cheating, affairs, all of it. But we never, never, never for one moment say, oh, where was God when we were doing it? It's the same thing. 
it's the same thing, but we want to be so where was God, right? And project and, and ask those questions when it's the other way. Exactly. Arrested development. They are literally chained to these altars. And so this is what the enemy does. He comes in to chain and to tie you down. And here's the thing. For those that continue to get experience love bombing after love bombing after love bombing, right? You're not discerning and, you know, and it's just happening, right? And it's it's no it could be you you are love bombed in relationships numerous times so that now you discern those signs, but now you're being love bombed in these demonic churches, right? You're being love bombed by the prophets of Baal. Yo, that's a whole nother story, right? <laughs> you're being love bombed by them, right? Them seeing all your gifts, your talents, your anointing, like because they can see it. They can see it. They operate with familiar spirits. They can see it. Sometimes the anointing, it, it, the anointing just is what it is. So you may not even realize that these things just flow off you effortlessly and they see it, right? You know, one thing about a butterfly is it doesn't get to see the beauty of itself. It doesn't see its wings. And a lot of times when you are still in that process of healing and when you are still in that process of self-discovery, right? Self-development, you may not see yourself or who you truly are, but us on the outside, we're looking at you saying, man, look at the gifts of God on this person. Look at the talents and the anointing and you, you, you're blind to it because just like the butterfly doesn't see its beauty, sometimes you don't. And this is why community is important because they're going to they're going to see it they're going to edify you they are going to pull it out of you right we're not going to leave you like that no we're not going to leave you we're going to make sure that everything that god put in you it, it it gets used like and i'm not saying used in a bad way but it goes to work so that you pour into the lives that god has for you to pour into right so now um what 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 the, what what actually what what the enemy wants to do is to get you to just feel like you're so different from anybody else from everybody else that nothing good can come from you didn't they say nothing um what can come from um from right i just draw a blank y'all but anyway what what can come from nazareth right but like listen this is what the enemy wants you to think. And so even now we see how that that these 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 altars of deception, they end up leading to um, addictions, love addictions. So you go from this this narcissist to that one, to that person, to this one. And this is where also you begin to see that, listen, you you get used to the highs that come with the love bombing, even though they may not come from the same type of source. What do I mean? It, it may not be an intimate partner. It may not be a spouse. But now, like I was saying, it could be the prophets of Baal. It could be your workplace. It could be your workplace. It could be your friend group. It could be anything different because the enemy is always going to weasel his way in. You got to understand he's sly. He's cunning. He's going to try to find a way in one way or the other. So he is going to change like the shapeshifter that he is, the angel of light that he is, and, and, and catch you off guard. That's why, again, we stay ready so we don't have to get ready, right? So what the enemy wants and what this what this stagnation and, and spirit of delay come, it introduces addictions into your life. So even when we think about being addicted to pain, let's talk about struggle love, right? Because listen, unless he's beating me, he doesn't love me, right? But that's 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 that that's now a demonic altar because somebody who loved you and who they didn't love you, right? But who who professed to love you, claim to be on your side, right? And claim to be there for you. But now they're socking you in the head and telling you it's because I love you so much. You had me enraged. I was so jealous. I had to communicate that to you as if there are no words and all the words in, in every language have expired. No, there is a way to communicate love, but because that's their assignment, you got, you got to understand that that's their assignment. And somebody that hits you nine out of 10, this is not their first time. You are not their first victim. They they already know how to how to play the role to throw in that first punch, and it is it's not going to stop. It is not going to stop there. So when somebody put the first time they touch you, please take it for what it is. Take it for what it is and move on. Take it for what it is because they're gonna come love bomb you again. They just did a massive devaluation here. And that, that in itself authorizes something else at this altar. If you continue to stay there, right? And 
If you continue to stay there, and this is where we even see that spirit of death begin to spring up, that spirit of premature death spring up, because when you stay there for some people, there are some people that didn't make it out like you. So while you feel like life may be over and I, I'm not going to I'm not going to get out of this, there are some people who truly are have been buried because of it. So, you know, we can give God praise that we are still here. That's for some, for many of us, we're no longer in these relationships. The first time they put their hands on you, you got to get out of that thing. And, you know, it, and I'm not saying that pack up your bags immediately, but figure out your way of escape. You've got to get out of that thing. But what the enemy wants to do is introduce addictions because some people begin to get addicted to that violence because of how, remember that, that hit from the devil's cocaine and you continue to go back. You continue to go back for more. So after that first hit, they're going to come back and love bomb you real good. That's just how it works. That's how it works. Some people will, some people will, some narcissists, sociopaths will, will lavish you with vacations, gifts, and all kinds of things. But you got to understand that there was a price that was paid for you, that there is not a single thing on earth that can replicate the gift of Christ for you on Calvary's cross. You got to understand that the blood that was shed was more powerful than anything that somebody could buy. It's not worth a Gucci bag. It's not worth a Gucci belt. It's not, pair, it's not worth a pair of red bottoms. I don't care if they're taking you to the, uh, the French Riviera. None of that is going to compare to the price that was already paid for you. So you don't have to diminish yourself and say, this is all that I can do because that's what the enemy wants you to do. The enemy, you know, what happens is when we start to experience these, especially when you notice these cycles of the, of your life, you think I have to hold on to this narcissist because this is my ticket out of here. When this is your tickets to to the wide path, this is your tickets to death and doom and gloom, and that's just that's just what it is. There is not a, nar a relationship with a narcissist that is going to go on the on the on the narrow path because listen, that's idolatry. <laughs> It's idolatry. It's not going to lead to the high, to the narrow path until you make the decision that I'm coming out of agreement with it. I'm breaking agreement with the spirit of idolatry. I'm breaking agreement with the spirit of fear and I'm coming out head first in Jesus name. So listen, you got to be very mindful. This is when, when, when you start beginning to make excuses, putting on makeup in a way to cover up the scars, the wounds, when you're staying in the house because of because you don't want people to see and you start lying to cover up for them. All you are doing at this point is number one, you solidify that agreement, but now you're actually being willing for those chains to, to get a little tighter and restrict you from moving forward because you're not supposed to break off that altar. This is why demonic altars are so powerful, but but listen, even though they are powerful, we know who we know who pray, who, who whose name is above all names, that the price that he paid can destroy these altars. So never for a minute think that there is no way out, because that, again, is the deception the enemy wants you to think. So sometimes you will think, think that, oh, I don't have any money. I don't have a job. Um, I don't have any family. Oh, and another thing about deception leads you to isolation, right? So all of those things are going to make you feel like there is no way out, but that's all driven by the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear comes in with that first blow. The spirit of fear comes in with the first devalue. The spirit of fear comes in even in the love bombing stage when they tell you like, listen, if you ever cheat on me, you gonna know. And so you're going to be like, what am I going to know? What am I going to know? What are they going to do? But yet, because a lot of times in many instances, it may not be yours, but it's somebody's instant, that there is that that there is still that wounded inner child that thinks, oh my goodness, they love me so much that they're willing to be to be crazy for me. No, that's not a flex. That's really not a flex. But when we're thinking about the addiction, right, the enemy wants you addicted to struggle love. Because if you're addicted to struggle love in this relationship and it doesn't work out, right, because we know there's a time, there's a time limit on these relationships. And if this, if this narcissist here that you're involved with is one that um, comes with physical abuse, the one that comes with a verbal assault doesn't feel so bad, but that's still emotional abuse.
They still don't love you. They still don't care. That relationship also still has an expiration date. So they may not beat you, but they're emotionally abusive. But you say, oh, they're not beating me and they spend money on me. So they love me. It's the same thing. The enemy gets you addicted to the cycle. The enemy comes to get you addicted to struggle love. And then also, you, he wants you addicted to people pleasing. He wants you addicted to people, but you can't please God and you can't please man in the same breath. You got to choose who you shall serve. You got to make your election known that do I, am I going to be worried about pleasing God or am I going to please man? Because it's just not, it's just not both. There is no equal scale here. It's one or the other. So you got to, you got to figure that out. Enemy also wants you addicted to, to, for some people, alcohol. Oh, girl, it's just wine. Let's go get bottomless mimosas. But how are you going to be sober off bottomless mimosas? And I'm not coming after, you know, if that's your thing, but I'm just, uh, we're just talking here. There has to be a limit because we're talking about addictions. And the thing about addictions is this is how strongholds are formed. So we got to be sure like this and uh, what are we doing? And you have to, we have to get to the point where we mature spiritually and start asking ourselves those difficult questions, right? There's that addiction. I mentioned it earlier to sex, right? Where we now, where we now have people that will overlap relationships because the best way to get over somebody is to get under somebody. The best way to get over somebody is to get on top of somebody, but in what worlds? What, because what, what was done was done internally. It wasn't done physically, right? The assault was on your soul, not your body. And you got to really realize this, that it literally is a war for your soul. It is a war for your soul. You are your, your soul, your mind. And I mentioned at the very beginning, the initial point of impact is your mind. Whoever has, whoever has control of your mental faculties owns you. Whoever, whoever you are listening more the most to is going to influence you one way or the other. So you got to be careful about what you are allowing to go in you because it's going to come out through you. I'm, I'm trying to tell you, you got to be very mindful of that. So even when you begin to, when we even talk about the addictions, we were talking early about that retail therapy that, oh, I'm just going to go shopping, girl. It's retail therapy. Like I'm going to feel so much better after I have all these 99 shoes and two feet and nowhere to go in these shoes. But now I'm just being reckless with it because now we're being irresponsible with what we should be stewards with, which is our finances. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. These, listen, these are just, it just is what it is. Sometimes we just think, especially we remember when we were on lockdown with that pandemic, right? With that pandemic, when we were all on lockdown, Amazon was booming because everybody was just charge it, charge it. Let me go online. Let me go Amazon. Let me get it. Things we didn't need. Things we didn't need. And afterwards, and people were like, oh, because there were people that were getting money from the government, right? Buying things that they weren't supposed to be buying, doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing. But later on, it's time to pay for those consequences. We got to be mindful about this. We're supposed to be good stewards with what we have been given. And you got to understand that, you know, the, the the world, the systems of the world will teach you that all of these things from shopping to drinking to eating to um, all of it can be therapeutic, but you got to understand that these are also forms of bondage. There are also forms of bondage. And these are the things that can end up tying you to having that low self-esteem. They're going to keep you in survival mode. They're going to keep you from showing up as who God said that you are. And so this is where you got to look at this now as a fiery dart from the enemy. And so you got to ask yourself, like, listen, am I going to, am I going to keep on taking these darts or am I going to have the courage to pull them out of my back and fight back because this is what it is. When you start looking at the patterns of your life and you got to be honest about yourself and take stock of where am I right now? And we may not know how we got here and that's okay, but let's talk about where am I right now? And when you begin to find and you begin to identify the patterns in your life, when you begin to be honest with yourself and you are actually very prayerful about where you are, a lot of times, you know, I, I remember talking to a young lady went from a malignant narcissist to a covert. This man, 
it's so crazy sometimes when you hear people's stories and and you hear the heartbreak in their voice, you hear the disappointment and the pain. The relationship was about 18 months long. It wasn't that, you know, it wasn't that long, but it was 18 months long, but it was mostly love bombing throughout the relationship. Why was there love bombing throughout the relationship? Because we were on lockdown. We were on lockdown and people had time to do stuff. People had time to do stuff online. We can't, we can't meet because it was, it was a wonderful time for the narcs. We can't meet, but let me tell you all these sweet things so that when I come do what I do, you're going to pay for it. So when you think about it and how I had to explain it to her is like that altar that was set there was, was deception and every lie was another, was another chain going around you. It was another, you know, it was, it was another, another round of this demonic chain that was tying you down to this altar, literally keeping you bound. Because even though that relationship was only 18 months and you know how they say, well, um, people ask, well, how long do I have to go through? How long do I have to feel these emotions? she's still going through with it. She's still going through because of all the things that were piled onto her. Yeah, you can do the work and you can you can do the work and you can begin to untie yourself. But when you untie yourself, there's a pattern that it needs that needs to happen. I'm not saying you have to get it all together, but there are different things. There are different layers. There are different, you know, with each loop of a chain, it's one thing. So it's deception, it's, it's fear, it's abandonment, it's rejection, it's sorrow. But when this is a pattern of your life. She was at the point where I'm just tired. I'm depleted spiritually. Now we begin to see how your virtues and the importance of guarding your heart. Listen, guard your heart. It is so important because listen, the heart is the seat of the emotions, but in order to get to your heart, they got to run through your mind first. So you got to filter what people are saying. And when I say filter, I'm not talking about filter with your girlfriend. You got to filter it with the word of God. There's nothing wrong with talking to your girlfriend because God knows I'm going to call up my, be like, girl, did you, let me tell you. But you got to filter it with the word of God. You got to sit with it in prayer and take that thing in to God in prayer. Because it's one thing to see somebody so talented, so anointed, and with so much potential be so um, despondent because because at this point, after all the everything that she's been through up until this moment, up until that covert, right? Up until the good guy, because that was his game. He was like, I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. I'm a great father. Post all the pictures with the kids on social media. Good father where? But you know, when, when the lies, the deception really sets in, you got to start confronting that with the truth, but the fight, you got to understand that, again, the battle for your soul, right? And the battle for your soul, you've got to fight so many different things off. It's not just the deception. It's not just the backwardness because what happens is another thing with the backwardness, when you ruminate, you got to understand, here go another fiery dart. Rumination is not okay. I don't, I, I, there are so many channels that will talk to you about ruminating being part of the process. And I understand that, you know, as part of the process of healing, you got to be able to reflect and where did I come from? How did I end up here? But we don't stay there. We don't park our car there and just sit there. We got to keep going forward. The Bible tells us, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of fear. So it says, yea, though I walk through, through the valley of the shadow of death, should I say, you walk through, you don't just stay there. You got to keep going. The problem is the enemy strikes so hard that he knocks you down. Remember when I said that, you know, we be praying sometimes that, you know, let the strong men fall down and die. The same witches and warlocks and sorcerers have that same prayer point that you fall down and die. And while you are down on you feeling like I'm I'm on this cold floor here. I'm on this hard floor and I can't get back up again because I'm depressed. I'm despondent. I am lost. I am lonely. I am confused. I can't trust anybody. Life is, what's the meaning of life? What's the point? You're asking and you're going through those motions. The, the enemy is not stopping. The fiery darts are going to continue to come through. That's why when you ruminate, you can ruminate literally for months at a time before you break out of it. So I tell you, when you start ruminating, you got to get in the word of God immediately. 
quickly. You got to begin to turn up a praise because you have something to break. And there is something about praise that just confuses the enemy, especially when you are down on, when you are down on that cold floor of disappointment, of defeat. And one thing about the cold, you know, being at rock bottom, so to speak, is that you just can posture yourself a little differently so that instead of lying down, you can actually fix your position in lying down so that you prostrate in worship, right? You can also position yourself to get on your knees and begin to pray, but you cannot and you must refuse to stay down. And what happens, and I know this is happening to quite a few people in this season that you feel like, listen, so many things are coming at me and I've got my back against the wall and I don't know which way to go. There are so many contradictory messages. And one thing, like I talked a few like, a few weeks ago about those prophets of Baal, right? And Shannon talked about it too um, this past weekend and the one before that, I believe it was. But we see this uprising of these demonic altars that are being erected. And one thing that is really being released in this season and in this dispensation is that spirit of fear. You got to recognize that, oh, oh my goodness. Oh, we word war three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Rumors of war, right? Yeah. Okay. Talk of war, rumors of war. Do not fear. Listen, the spirit of fear is really being released in this generation because even when you think about these social media people, these uh, content creators, a lot of things that people push out is they push out. And this where this where some 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 favorite some people's favorite prophets they operate in this too. They were like, oh, okay, so and so did a video about this. Let me jump on that because they got one million views. So they're giving the appearance of godliness, but no power whatsoever because they're just copying to get the likes, the views. And so this is where that discernment is so important because even them, they be loving, love bombing you on their platforms. And you got to be mindful because they say the right thing. They, they, they see what you're doing, but you got to understand that as we get to the end of times, and I've said this before, we get to the end of times, the spirit of Jezebel is released again in the, in the earth. It's in our, it's in your Bible. And when the spirit of Jezebel is in the earth, you got to understand that there has to be prophets of Baal. So we know that there are false prophets all over the place. And that's why you see so many prophetic platforms. Am I saying that every prophetic platform is a lie and is, is driven by the spirit? Of course not, because they have to be Elijah's in that same season. And so we understand that towards the end of time, the spirit of Elijah is what is going to be in the earth that, or, you know, we're going to see that. And it's there. We're seeing it. They are very, they are very um, godly, right? Godly, godly platforms, godly people, godly ministry, godly churches. But there are those false ones. There are those false ones, and they are all love bombing people with these fake miracles, these fake deliverances, these fake healings, um, and all of that. All that is doing, right, is tying people down to these demonic altars. That's why you say, can't they see? No, they can't see. The, the, the chain's gone over their eyes. They're blind now. But in order for you to also have some of these false prophets and teachers, they got to have the audience, right? And, and, and the Bible talks about the, your, t you know, um, about the tickling ears, you know, wanting your ears tickled because people have the desire to have their ears tickled because people want to hear that your kingdom spouse around the corner. It's your season, boo, new car, new house, new job, new this, new that. People have a desire to hear this. When we look at biblical prophets, they came to bring correction. They came to bring direction. They came with a prophetic word that told you to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And not a single time they were prophesying other things. Now, is it wrong for them to prophesy? Uh, no, but I'm just saying, what does their foundation say? Test the fruits, because that in itself is love bombing masses in this season. And so we're not going to fall for that. You're going to take your time and you're going to pray about what you listen to and you're going to pray for who you listen to so that you are not deceived. Like the Bible tells us that, you know, we're sheep among wolves. That means you got to learn to live amongst wolves. That means you got to be wise. You got to be discerning so that you are not deceived right? Especially when, especially when we're still in this journey of healing, when we're still in this journey of growth, when we're still trying to figure some things out, it's so important that you are sober. That's why those addictions, those strongholds, right? Wise as a serpent, those strongholds, 
because remember the addictions, they come to desensitize you. You can be, you can be, listen, the thing about it is if you are somebody that is, that has an, let's talk about an addiction to alcohol. Your mind is never going to have that moment of where, where you are sober and you can think because you're going to chase that next drink. When you really think about alcoholics, you can literally calculate the number of hours in a day or in a period of time where they are not, where they are not drunk. That means where their mind is sober. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm, and I'm not saying this because, oh, I'm just, uh, I got a mouth, I can talk, but I've seen it. I have alcoholics in my family. I know how they work, right? So I know how it's very hard to have a conversation with them because they're always drunk, right? Likewise with drug addicts, you, you see that zombie drug that's out in Philly. I know it's all over the place, but when that zombie drug was, was really released, just go on TikTok and type zombie drug. It's going to take you right to Kensington, Philadelphia, or Kensington, Pennsylvania. You, they are doped up. There is never a moment where they have the opportunity to be to be sober because once it's in their system, literally that's it. So how this is how the enemy wants people. This is how the enemy is working. He's he, this is how he's come to steal, kill, and destroy the bloodline. Because if you're not sober, how are you going to raise children? Immaturity. Immaturity, I'm, I'm saying it, immaturity will never raise children to maturity. That's why narcissists can't raise children to maturity. It's either going to be the grace of God and the mercy of God upon that child that they reach maturity, or it's going to be the community and other people. That's why we don't shut down community. And then here's another thing about community. Community, if you listen to society and culture, they're going to tell you, child, joy, as a single mom, how are you going to raise a son? But praise God for community because there are voices and there are people that are able to step in and help me in this journey. Not only help me practically and physically, but pray with me and pray for me, pray for him and pray for, you know, with me for him. So this is why community is important. You listen and community going to tell you, you are a man trying to raise a woman, how you, a, a little girl to become a woman. How are you going to do that again? with community in prayer don't allow and this is the this is another thing about that spirit of fear it's going to tell you that i don't want to be a single mom so i gotta stay here and continue to be beat down you're a single mom went through it but thriving okay is 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 everything peaches and cream no but is life peaches and cream for anybody because if we're all honest there are things and there are seasons in life like life happens while we live but it's peaceful there is unity. There is love in the home. Can you say that when there's a narcissist? So when you get the opportunity to step out, never, ever, ever be afraid. Like, listen, let's, let's be like Peter and step out on the boat, but let's keep our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith. And we will not sink. We will not sink. So another thing, another thing, and I'm going to wrap this up soon because I still got a lot to say, but that we can save that for another live. Another thing, and I, but I do want to talk about this because I'm passionate about this one. That that spirit of of stagnation and backwardness and delay it also opens doors for that spirit of rejection, or the spirit of rejection, should I say, will open doors for that. They work in tandem, right? And there are different demons that are assigned to these different spirits, and so now we begin to see how they group and how they come together. And you can, and I remember talking to somebody that was saying, "Oh my goodness, this is too much joy. I can't do." It, but you got to realize the same power that rose Christ from the dead is what is a work and alive in you. This is where you got to realize the authority that you have as a believer. That when, yeah, demons they band together and they group, but listen, as a believer, <laughs> pray. Well, how am I going to pray about it? Because I don't know what to say. Okay, now you're going to ask God for the grace to disband these groupings of demons. Every demonic conference that has gathered against me be broken now in the name of Jesus. You're going to speak. You're going to you're going to speak what you want to see in that situation based on the word of God. Like, listen, the Bible tells us, right? That a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. What does that mean? And how does it look like when we're in spiritual warfare? It means that if I say, oh God, arise and let my enemies be scattered, we're causing and we're calling forth that this, this house be divided against itself. So yeah, you can absolutely do it, but you pray in faith.
and we live our lives according to the word of God, right? So why are we going to feel defeated? Why are we going to allow the, the schemes of the enemy to make us feel like there is no way out when there literally is no way out for the enemy because he's unrepentant, just like his, his little foot soldiers, same thing, unrepentant. And so you've got to really realize that, listen, everything that the enemy threw at you doesn't mean that you have to just fall down and take it. Everything that the narcissist said and sugarcoated to you, yeah, it, it, and here's the thing, love bombing, it comes to sugarcoat everything and just present a different thing to you. But what you got to realize is that you are the salt of the earth. So there's a, you, you got to expect a different flavor. The salt of the earth is going to be something that preserves. It's going to be something that um, causes change to happen. Not this sugar, because when you really think about sugar, remember we talked, I think a few live streams ago, when we talked about sugar, and how, how sugar causes inflammation in our natural body. Sugar brings that same, and, and when I say sugar, sugar-coated words, right? Just let people speak the facts. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be nasty with how you speak the facts, but just speak the facts in truth and in love. The Bible tells us, let the law of kindness always be on our mouth. So you can speak facts, but just remember, keep the law of kindness close by, operate like that, right? Speak your facts. Because what the enemy and the narcissist does in the love bombing stage is present you with sugar-coated words, a sugar-coated reality when it's fake. And all it's going to do is cause that inflammation within your mind. And so when your mind begins to swell and your mind begins to be unsettled and, there, and the chemicals in your brain begin to become unbalanced because that's what sugar does to your brain anyway, these sugar-coated words are going to do the same thing. And so now you have this inflammation. Inflammation in the body is painful, but inflammation in your soul hurts too. And so it's just going to be a manifestation of those lies. You do not need to be bound by the lies of the enemy. You know, Jesus asked the man at the pool of that said in Luke chapter five, do you want to be healed? It's the same thing that he asks us today. Do you want to be healed? It's our decision to pick up our bed and walk. But this is where the thing is that, oh, I can't, I'm chained down on this and that and all of these demonic altars and it always these witches and since when a witch going to pro uh, prosper over you when the Bible tells you no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Yeah, it can strike you. It can make you feel like, listen, this is hard. I can't. But you got to recognize that the power that rose Christ from the dead is what is alive and active in you. When, they, when you feel like, oh, I can't recognize spirit of fear cast it down, deal with it, repent, break agreement with it, start paying attention to the things that come out of your mouth. Because what comes out of your mouth sometimes is what, what has been programmed into your subconscious, but the enemy wants to use those things to keep you stuck in certain things, in certain cycles, in certain patterns. You're going to speak your way out of it. Am I saying that all oh, you just speak and things are going to happen? No, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that when I say speak, use your words where they are most effective. And that is in prayer. That is the speak that I am saying to you today. So for today, I will say, uh, I'm going to close our live tonight because we've been here for so, a minute, but I'll come back and I'll do, uh, I'll do a part two. I'll probably come through one of the mornings in this week and we can finish up. But I want to thank you so much for joining me. I thank you so much for sharing your time with me. Uh, I pray that God would bless you. Hey, Lenise, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I encourage you to go back and listen to um, the replay. We are about to pray our way out of here. So Father, we come before you tonight in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you, Lord, for the information that you have given us, the information, oh God, that has the power to set us free, the information, Lord, that has the power to heal us and deliver us, the information, oh God, that has the power to change the trajectory of our lives. Father, we come before you tonight with our hearts wide open to you, and we repent before you tonight, and we ask God that you would be merciful upon us. We thank you, oh God, Father, for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins, and we praise you, Father, that we have the honor of calling on the name that is above all names. We surrender our heart, mind, soul, and spirit spirit unto you today. We present our bodies to you as a living sacrifice. We ask, I ask God that you would 
touch the lives of my brothers and sisters, that God, you would heal them in the areas where they need healing. I pray, Father, that you would order their steps to the places that you have appointed for them to experience that healing, for the places you have appointed for them to experience the deliver deliverance that is needed in their lives. Father, we stand in one accord and we thank you, oh God, for the armor of God. We are we dress ourselves in the full armor of God. We thank you, Father, for, for the pieces of our armor. We thank you, Father, for the that our loins are girded with truth, that we take up the breastplate of righteousness, that, oh God, our sh our feet are shod with the with a with a shoe, with a with the gospel of peace, the sh the, the shoes. And uh, for the uh, we thank you, oh God, for the sword of the spirit, the word that you have given us. And I pray, God, that there would be a hunger in us to study, to show ourselves approved. We thank you, God, for the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Father, we even thank you for just God, how gracious you are, that we're covered on all sides when we when we have the armor. And I pray, God, that you would teach us all how to stand flat footed, 10 toes down on the word. I pray, Father, for every life that is here, for every household that is here. Father, we come against the deception that we have, that has, that has been in the, that has been released into the atmosphere, into the world at this time. We come against the spirit of fear in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. And we command the strong man of fear, the strong man spirit behind the spirit of fear to come out of its illegal places, to come out of its hiding places and present itself before the courts of heaven where he will face the judgment of God. Father, we pray even now, O God, that you would pour out your judgment upon every spirit of fear, torment, backwardness, um, delay, stagnation, deception that has brought disruption into the lives of your sons and daughters. I pray, Father, that you would begin to begin to maneuver in their hearts, that, Father, you would illuminate the truth of, of who you are to them. I pray, God, above all, that they would they would seek you while there is time. I pray, Father, for that hunger and that thirst after righteousness, the hunger for your word, the hunger for your truth, for we know that your word is a lamp and a light. And I pray, Father, that you would continue to heal them from the secret things. Some people don't talk about what they've been through, but praise God that you have seen absolutely absolutely 100% of all our lives. And so you know the hidden pain. You know the secret pain. We come to break agreement tonight with the spirit of shame. We destroy spirit of shame. We uproot it now in the name of Jesus. We call it out. We cast it down tonight. We declare that, Father, we will not walk in shame. We, we will not walk even in toxic shame. We break agreement tonight with a spirit of anxiety. We refuse to be anxious because your word told us that we are to be anxious for nothing, but in all things through prayer and supplication. So God, we even repent for those things tonight. We break agreement with anxiety tonight. We will not be anxious even as news channels continue to, to hype up and play on people's emotions. Father, I pray that your sons and daughters would begin to recognize when they are being manipulated emotionally. Oh God, I pray that you would arise and cause their household enemies to be scattered in the name of Jesus. I pray in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ that every tormentor would receive the torment. Let them fall in the pits that they have built for your sons and daughters. And when I say tormentors, y'all, I'm talking about the spirits that are at work here. The devil didn't come to play nice with you. The devil didn't come to, 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 to throw little things at you. He came to steal, kill, and to destroy. You got to understand that the enemy came. And when the enemy came in, he came in for for your life. He came in for the bloodline. So why are we going to be, why are we going to be afraid to actually pull out those fiery darts that the enemy sunk into our backs and, 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 and send them back to where they came from. So God, we pray that every fiery dart that is being projected into our lives, we command them now to turn around and boomerang right back to where they came from in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for the brokenness that is felt because of the deception. Father, I thank you that when we call on the name of Jesus. We call on the one who is able to heal, restore, and redeem. And I pray that you would touch the lives of your sons and daughters. I pray that you would begin to take them not just to a place of healing, but God to a place of wholeness. Father, we are seeking you for restoration on tonight. 
And I thank you, God, that when you do a thing, you do a complete thing, you do a whole thing. So, Father, I praise you that you are touching lives, that you are that you are bringing forth healing, deliverance, not just mentally, emotionally, but Father, physically, financially, spiritually. We are thanking you even now for radical change that is taking place in our lives. We refuse to remain stagnant. We command every chain that has held us back down on demonic altars to break now in the name of Jesus. We command every padlock that has has chained our destiny and our belongings to break now in the name of Jesus. Father, we are asking God that you would begin to give us a spirit of prayer, a praying spirit. I pray, God, that you would give my brothers and sisters the boldness to come before you, oh God, that they would obtain your mercy in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that they would begin to pray bolder prayers, that there would be no more limitations. I come against that spirit of prayerless. I come against that spirit that says, I don't know how to pray. And we break it now in the name of Jesus. I disconnect my brothers and sisters from every demonic altar that has held them down. We destroy it tonight. We smash it with the hammer of God. We command it to fall down and die. We command that every fiery dart that has come our way go back to their senders in the name of Jesus. We break agreement tonight with the spirit of fear. You told us in your word that you did, not, you did not give us a spirit of fear, but Father, we will walk in power, love, and a sound mind according to your word. We refuse to be defined by the limitations of man, by the limitations of trauma. We refuse that, oh God. And we will, and we boldly say that we are who you say that we are. Father, I pray that as you move in the hearts of my brothers and sisters, that you would touch every life that is connected to them. We bring our households under the blood of Jesus tonight. I pray, God, that you would soak and saturate our homes with the blood of Jesus. Let the blood of Jesus drip from the ceiling right down to the foundations of our homes. In fact, let it drip from the roof, the roof right down to the foundations of our homes. We apply the blood of Jesus by faith to every doorpost in our home. And we ask, oh God, that you would watch over our homes tonight as we go to sleep. As we step into the spirit realm tonight, we command that we command every, every plot, plan, and tactic of the enemy to attack us in our sleep to fall down and die now. We will not be, we will not be shaken. We will not be fearful. I speak blessings over our our pillows tonight. And I ask, oh God, for the grace to dream well tonight, for the grace that we would have the interpretation of our dreams. We thank you, Father, that no matter what the dream looks like, there is always a message that you are giving us that we can that we can take and we can learn for. So God, I pray for every dreamer tonight. I pray, Father, that as they dream, God, I pray that they would remember we come against every dream erasing spirit tonight in the name of Jesus. We command you to hold your peace and get in your position, which is under our feet. We will not be shaken and we will not be moved. I pray, Father, that my brothers and sisters begin to flourish in their in, in their spiritual gifts. I pray for increased discernment. I pray for increased wisdom. I pray for the spirit of revelation to come upon them in a stronger way. I pray for the maturation of, our, of their gifts, oh God. And I pray, Father, the doors that they have been knocking on, let those doors begin to open. I thank you for open doors. I thank you, Father, for changing situations. I thank you, Father, for the favor that is coming upon them. I thank you, God, for your will being established and fulfilled in their lives. Father, I pray for everybody that will come and watch the replay. I pray, Father, the same prayer over their lives. And we just thank you, God. We remember those that are in that are experiencing, those that are in war-torn areas. We pray, oh God, for the those that cannot, the, the most vulnerable. We lift up the children before you and we cry out to you for mercy. We pray, God, that they would have access to the supplies that they need. We pray, God, that they would have access to the medications that they need. And above all, we pray, Father, that your truth would reach them, that your word would, 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 would provide them with comfort and peace in the situations that they are. We pray, God, that you would deliver them out of those situations the same way that you did the children of Israel out of Egypt. God, I pray for those 
those that are those believers, God, the blood bought believers that are experiencing war, that are experiencing the effects of war. God, we call on you, Father, to remember your children. I pray, God, that you would arise in their lives and cause their enemies to be divided against themselves. I pray that every plot, plan, scheme, and tactic of the enemy to destabilize believers right now begin to fall apart. I pray for the disintegration of the plans and the plots and the schemes of the demonic kingdom. Father, as the demonic army is getting, it appears that they're getting stronger. We speak division amongst them. We pray, oh God, that they would begin to fight against themselves, that Father, the very plans that they had to come forth, let them be confounded, that those plans would never come to pass in the name of Jesus. We declare this over our lives and our spiritual enemies and your enemies, oh God. May they never prosper in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that, Lord, in your presence, we have fullness of joy. You said in your word that that um, that we can lift up our eyes. Your word says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh our help. And so we lift up our eyes to you tonight. And I pray, God, that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. I declare tonight, God, that there, there is no other above you and there is no other that we love more than you. And I pray, Father, that these will not just be confessions that roll off our lips, but Father, let it be the posture that you find us in. I pray against everything that is fighting us, our own proclivities, our own preferences, the things that we call standards and the patterns that have been established established in our lives because of church culture. Father, we don't want church culture. We want hearts that are after you. So I pray, God, that you would crucify our flesh, crucify our desires. We want to die to self tonight, oh God. And I pray that at the end of all, and when all is said and done, that Father, we would live lives that are pleasing unto you. That Father, the lives that we live, let them not be in vain, God. Let our desire and our, and our commitment to serving you not be in vain, but Father, let this be an altar that we erect, that the generations that will follow after us every single generation. Let it be that they will live because of these altars. They will serve you because of the godly altars that we are erecting. I pray, Father, that every person here would begin to posture themselves in a, in a position of prayer. Father, I know that there is nothing of eternal consequences that does not happen without prayer. Father, I pray that you would make us people of prayer. I pray, God, that you would give us a praying spirit that no matter where we are, oh God, we would find ourselves in prayer. I pray, oh God, that every person on here would have a praying spirit. Help us, oh God, to have a praying spirit. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth, that we would recognize the emotional manipulation that happens in some church homes, the emotional manipulation that happens in platforms. Oh God, we break agreement tonight with the plans of the enemy over our lives lives, things that we have been in agreement, I pray you would open our eyes collectively, that we would be able to see what we cannot see, that we would begin to see the spirit at work in people. God, I pray you show us the spirit at work in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, we would be able to hear what is being said that we're not actually hearing, but what is being said before they even take up their positions on their platforms, that they're different altars. <laughs> I ask, oh God, for the grace to yield to the unctioning of your Holy Spirit. Father, have your way in our lives tonight in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this time and we honor you and declare our love for you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I was just, I was reminded while we were praying, right? I was reminded while we were praying, there is a time that I was praying and my prayer was like, God, show me my enemies, show me who they are. But what happened is God didn't necessarily show me the person, but he showed me the spirit the person walked in. And it's something when you begin to see the spirit because you get to see how ugly it is, even though that person presents themselves as, as a beautiful person, as a, you know, just somebody that you think, wow, you know, this person is awesome and all of these things. But when I saw the spirit, spirit of that person. There was no question about who they were and what their agenda was. And so I want to encourage you, like, listen, begin to ask God to reveal the spirit. You got to understand the 
Bible says we have not because we ask not. Another thing is as you pray that, ask God to prepare your heart for what you will see. One one time I remember I was I was I, I was just minding my business going to sleep and you know the enemy showed up in his raggedy way and so this spirit comes to attack me, right? But when when I I had been in that vein where I was praying, show me the spirit. So instead of not being able to see and I'm just being attacked, I saw the spirit. Y'all, the whole Baphomet spirit. And so I began to pray and ask, well, what is this spirit trying to release in my mind? But then I knew what I saw. So now I begin to begin to realize what does the Baphomet represent and what are the spirits that are attached to it? So then I'm able to see, oh, this is what you're trying to legalize in my life? Because if I'm taken over by that spirit of fear, it opens a door. So this is why, you know, I know that fear is a natural response and you may, you may operate or you may have that response, but don't say it, you, you don't lay down there. You can say, you know what? Yes, God, I'm, I'm fearful right now. And I repent, but I thank you that you are with me. You begin to pray against that thing. You become, you begin to come out of agreement. So based on what you are seeing, right, you are now in a position to pray against it because I, just like I was showing the Baphomet, right. And yo, I was like, how is this? Because it was presenting as something nice. And so now I see the spirit and I'm like, okay, okay. Now I know the work that needs to be done. And it's not that it's a one-time prayer. Sometimes you're going to have to pray some things for a season, but allow yourself to do those things because the more you pray, the more you are building your godly altar, the more you are investing in, in the lives of the generations that are coming after you, because the more you pray, right? the more you wear them out. The, and when I say them, I'm talking about the, the demonic kingdom because the, the enemy comes to wear you out. And so that's why for some people, he doesn't want you to pray because he understands that some of your prayers, they are sharpshooters that they will hit the bull's eye each and every time. And so as you pray, it's like, it's like there are things that are, you know, it, God is hearing your prayers and the enemy does not want you to do that. And even the more you pray, the more it edifies you to know that, you know what, I'm in communication with my father and your relationship with God grows. The enemy comes to break that up. And so he begins to instill in you that I can't, this is what God told me way back in the day. He, be, when he told me, put down the prayer books, and I was like, but God, you know, I don't know how to pray at this and this is I'm going to teach you. And it was a spirit. And what he was showing me is that you're so fearful that you don't trust me and you don't trust my words that I have given you everything you need in my word and everything that you need is already on the inside of you. The Bible tells us that we're to, you know, the, the Holy Spirit prays through us for the same, for that very reason. We know not what to ask for. So the Holy Spirit prays with us. This is why when we posture ourselves for prayer, right, we got to be sure that we're inviting the Holy Spirit into that moment where asking the Holy Spirit to pray through us. Hey, Solomon, it's great to see you, faith-based workplace. I'm looking forward to what you have to talk about tomorrow night. God bless you. And if you haven't checked out faith-based workplace, please do go ahead over to his channel, him and his wife. She was in early, she was in um, Nart Free Living. So go check them out too. Awesome, awesome content, right? So, um, and safe place. So when it comes to that spirit that attacks, don't don't allow yourself to be lazy. Don't allow yourself to with to retreat because that's what the enemy wants. And a lot of times we feel like, especially when your back is against the wall, sometimes you get to a place where you feel like I just don't have the strength. I don't have the words. And you're already the enemy comes to discourage you to not do that. And that's that's his goal. His goal is to keep you from going into that secret place. But there is something about prayer. You all there is something about prayer I, I i challenge you right and this is a challenge that i'm i'm also going to stick to this myself schedule a day a whole 24 hours where you can actually just be shut in no disturbance nothing oh but that's radical joy that's a bit much 24 how bad do you want it how bad do you want your life to change? How bad do you want your future generations to change? You got to be willing to do something different, to experience something different. Does it mean that, oh, God is going to answer you like that? He's going to answer you when he knows that you need that, when he needs to, right? But what we're doing is developing our prayer life. And not only are we developing our prayer life, we are erecting a godly altar. So does that mean that it's going to be 24 hours of continuous prayer? No, but it's the mindset. 
said. So when you shut in, and I love a shut in, y'all. I love a shut in. When you shut in, that means there is no disturbances. My children know this, but sometimes, of course, they join me too. Sometimes I send them off to my sister or even my parents or they go to their friends. And I, the whole house, every room where there is a TV, it is on worship every place in the house. And a lot of times you can do this during your season of fasting. So you say, I'm going on a fast. And when, when it's a dry fast, then that's what it is. But you're going in there with the mindset to build up this altar of prayer, right? And you are, you are, you are, you are dying to self literally because to be 24 hours with no phone, because we're going to put that thing on, do not disturb. And the only ones that are going to, the only calls that are going to be able to come through are those that are on our favorite list. And that's only, and we're going to let them know that, listen, I'm going to be on lockdown for the next 24 hours. Only call me in when there's blood involved, only call me for those type of serious emergencies. So they already know not to disturb. But now you can go into that secret place. There is a thing about prayer where you literally can feel yourself go through the different chambers where you feel like I'm going through the washing. And with that, with the stage of washing is where your confessions begin to take place. And there is something that happens in there that breaks something, right? And I'm just talking about continuous prayer. And then you feel yourself begin to go go through the process as you go towards the throne room. You can't get to the throne room just haphazardly. There, there is a certain type of posture and this is an experience I chase so bad, right? And I don't always get it, but the times that I have had it, it keeps me going back because there is something that when you know that you're in the holy of holies in the spirit, your prayer is just different because what can you say in the presence of a holy God? There is something about that, but it's the journey to that. This is why I'm saying get in the pos in the habit of having these shutdowns where it's nothing but worship, where you have your Bible, you're going to spend some time reading. You're going to spend some time worshiping. You're going to be praying. You're going to be saying the Lord's prayer. You're going, don't ever dismiss the power in the Lord's prayer. Don't ever, don't ever minimize the power in saying that prayer. <laughs> I saw this video, right? Whitfield Harrington right here on YouTube. And he talked about saying the Lord's prayer repeatedly. So I said, I'm going to do this bed. Let's see. I went ahead and did it. And you know what was so crazy for me is I, I, I said the Lord's Prayer several times over a period of time. And the way I began to see in the spirit and I could see that's that that was around the time where I began to see the, the spirit behind people. Right. So we're still talking, but it's all good, family. Um, um, I begin to see the spirit behind people. Right. I began to see crystal clear. So what I'm saying to you is when you go in for that 24 hour prayer and you don't have to start at 24 hours, start where you can, if it's 12 hours or whatever, but we got to build it up because you got to understand that the enemy is fighting you tooth and nail. The enemy is fighting you and we're not going to pray to fight the enemy. We're going to pray to draw closer to our God. We're going to pray because we, this is what, this is what it is. This is what it takes to be a disciple. We're going to pray to seek the heart of God. We're going to pray asking God to change us, right? We can all change. It doesn't matter where you are, what level you think that you are or how good it is. There's always another level. That's why it goes from round to round, right? And if we, and if we had reached the pinnacle of where we're supposed to be, then we would be, we would have gone home to glory because what good are we, right? So what I'm trying to say to you is build an altar of prayer because this is where we lay the foundations, right? And for me, I take this personally because I listen to people's stories where they talk about, oh, I had a praying grandmother. I had a, I never had a praying grandmother, period. On either side, I did not have one. And we're going to have this conversation at some point. One, deep in witchcraft. The other, in the occult. And when I say in the occult, I'm talking about pagan religion in a cult. Like y'all. So from both sides, there was no prayer. And so I want to be for my children's 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 children, that praying grandmother. So I got to take it seriously because when you consider some of the things now going, now you know my background on both sides, you understand the warfare that I come up against. You understand that the enemy's like, oh, okay. So she thinks she's going to elevate that. I'm going to throw this at her right? I'm going to throw this at her. And 
It's all strategic to keep us from these positions of prayer. It's all to keep us off our knees and to stay broken and bound. But in the name of Jesus, we're coming out. In the name of Jesus, we have already been set free. So I want to thank you so much, family for sharing your time with me tonight. It's been awesome having the opportunity to talk with you. I'm gonna be jumping on most likely Thursday morning, have my coffee with you in the morning so that we can just have random talk, right? I thought I was gonna talk about something, but I'm just gonna show up on Thursday morning. I'm gonna be my, my you know, I'm gonna be however I'm gonna be because it's morning, but I will have, I will have coffee. And we are going to just chat about whatever, I, you know, if you're free, join me. And if not, come back and watch the replay. But I really thank you so much for sharing your time with me tonight. God bless you all and have a fantastic night.